yeah it is going to be now it's preparing to live stream in the webinar okay. i got that screen yeah yes finally i got the screen please also record huh? yeah yeah i will record it automatically automatically will go on the yeah, i i think it is started now is it Yeah, let us look at the image start, please. Are you able to see the video on the YouTube? Now it is uh, streaming. Uh, Dr. Shwagata, yeah, I think yeah. you can make one or two additional co-hosts so they can get uh, recorded. If any problem, so that will be another uh, backup. Now it is online. It what is. is only host is can record. Now. Only host can record. So only Divya can record okay. right now. Yeah, uh, I, think host, host, uh, I think now yes. it is streaming. I think now it is streaming. Yes, 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 yes it's yes. streaming. So yeah, let's YouTube let's... live is streaming. Yeah, let's Congratulations. Congratulations. Hello, hello. Yeah, the bear. Uh, sir, wait a minute. Only wait a minute. So, I will make a panelist. Please retry again. It's coming okay, live yeah. now. It's coming live. Coming yeah. live. It was coming live. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is live. Okay, let's start. It is live on YouTube. Yeah. Sir, uh, please, please retry again. It's coming live. Ah, uh, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming live. Yeah, I can see it. Coming live. It was coming live. Asha, please mute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, BIT Mesra, please mute. The mute, uh, mute the uh, echo coming from YouTube. BIT Mesra, please mute. Uh, please, 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 we have passed all the technical glitches now. So let's start. So good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Swagat Paira is welcoming all participants, panelists, delegates, and presenter on behalf of South Asian Metrological Association and Villa Institute of Technology, MESRA. Without any further delay, because we are already late, I welcome the secretary of SAMA, Professor Shameshra Das. He is the backbone of all all of these activity. Welcome, sir. Now, floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Swagata. Am I audible clearly? Yes, sir. Yes. Great, thank you. So, uh, ABM, Dr. Ajit Tyagi, President of SAMA, Professor C. Jagannathan, Dean Research and Development Shell, BIT Mesra, distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Dr. R. R. Kelkar, Saab, uh, Forward Director General of Meteorology of India, Meteorological Department, and also Professor uh, at uh, University of Pune, formerly. Dr. Raj Kumar, Forward Director of uh, NRSC, that is the National Remote Sensing Center under ISRO. Dr. R.C. Bhatia, Chairman of the Advisory Panel of the Lecture Series, and also Forward Director, Additional Director General of Meteorology at IMD. Members of the Organizing Committee, Distinguished participants from more than 80 countries, ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you on behalf of the South Asian Meteorological Association and Virala Institute of Technology, BIT Mesra, India. This is a continuation of our efforts on capacity building of the people of this region. Many of you may already know that uh, we conducted the first online lecture series on atmospheric physics jointly with the SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai for four months during January to April 2023, in which uh, more than 2000 people from 48 countries registered for the course. Then we conducted the second online training on the WRF modeling system, jointly with the CDAC, uh, which is the Center for Development of Advanced Computing uh, in India during 3rd to 24th of April. 2023 with hands-on training also on the supercomputer of CDAC. And this is the third attempt on, cap on capacity building of the people in satellite meteorology. 
We have a distinguished panel of very senior scientists and professors from reputed institutions of this region who are experts in the fields. The syllabus of the lecture series has been designed based upon the feedback uh, and requirements of the member countries of SAMA. This lecture series is targeted to postgraduate students and professionals of non-meteorological background who are interested in learning the subject of new satellite meteorology. This lecture series will continue for five months, that is 20 weeks from 2nd September till 20th of January 2024. As you know, already as on today, more than 1600 candidates from 80 plus countries are registered for this course and the number is still increasing. Certificates will be given as announced in the email to the participants who attend at least 75% of the lectures. Those who are interested in receiving certificates with grades, that is outstanding, excellent, or very good, etc., will have to appear in an evaluation test by paying a small examination fee. The amount will be uh, announced later. It will be decided later. The lectures are live streamed on YouTube channel of SAMA. They will also be available afterwards on the YouTube for those who could not attend the course uh, live. We shall try to have more interactions between the speakers and the participants in this lecture series. Please write your questions in the chat box. Uh, our moderators will pick up the questions at the end of the lecture and they will be answered by the speakers. So enjoy the lectures and uh, I wish you all the best. So thank you. On to you, Dr. Swagata. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir, for that warm welcome. Now I would like to invite ABM retired professor Ajit Tagi, sir. He is the president of SAMA and also pillar of this institute. Sir, please, uh, uh, stage is yours. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Swagata. And uh, Somesh has already given the background of our capacity building initiatives. And uh, this is yet another uh, major uh, see, step in this direction of the organizing this training program for 20 weeks on satellite meteorology. And uh, it's a really heartening to see that what a excellent cooperation support which we have received in organizing this program. So if you see the history of satellite meteorology, it had been a success story of working together of the two leading institutions in the country, the space and the meteorological so in ISRO and the IBD had been working and the growth of satellite meteorology, its application is, is a wonderful example of this uh, cooperation, collaboration. And I am very happy that two of the joints of uh, respective departments, uh, Dr. Kelkar Sahab and Dr. Rajkumar Sharma have agreed to present uh, the history of um, Indian meteorological satellites and their applications and also the space and uh, programs uh, with which the ISRO is taking place. See, this culture of um, uh, multi-institutional cooperation, which is the hallmark of ISRO's success and also the IMD has imbibed as far as this satellite meteorology program is concerned, uh, is really heartening to see. And on the similar lines, this satellite training workshop also, we are happy that um, uh, DIT Mesra has posting this and extended full support. And wonderful part was that of our organizing committee led by Bhatia Saab with support from Baby Simon, uh, Haplial, and Asim Mitra from IMD. They did a wonderful work with the training needs assessment of the uh, South Asian countries, nine countries. So we were able to develop a good curriculum and we received support from all leading institutions and the professionals, be the IMAD, the NRSC, and SEC, Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, and academic institutions to deliver uh, important lectures. We are also not only the theoretical lectures, but will provide the hands on practice, the availability of the products which are with the IMAD and uh, uh, ISRO through the MESDOC and also the NRSC. So this is a good opportunity and seeing the overwhelming response uh, from not only from South Asian countries, but the world over, it shows that yes, um, uh, our training programs are, are doing good. And um, somehow I strongly feel that 
the potential of satellite meteorology has not been exploited fully. It has got so much uh, to deliver the for the science and the application both and also to various sectors. It's not only the meteorology, the hydrology, the ocean, hydro, uh, the biosphere, oceans, chemistry. So, so we need to open up and this particular training program, I'm sure will uh, take uh, this to the various users and stakeholders. So that way, uh, the, uh, this training program is going to be uh, yet another uh, attempt uh, of uh, doing a capacity building. So thank you so much to our all resource persons and special thanks to uh, BIT MESA for extending uh, support and hosting the team led by Swagata, uh, Divya and the Mili who have been working in the background and also uh, our, our team in, in the summer uh, who had been uh, seen at, at a zero budget. We had been working because of the volunteers, both uh, our uh, ground work workers and also the senior experts who uh, provide this assistance. So I, once again, thanks to Professor Kelkar and Dr. Daj Kumar for having agreed to deliver these lectures and Bhatia Saab uh, who had been uh, uh, source of strength for us in planning this program. Thank you so much. And I'm sure these 20 lecture series will, will be a, a part setter as far as the satellite meteorology is concerned, uh, popularizing this during the capacity building, not only within South Asia, but in the African and other developing countries as well. Thank you, Jai. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for your motivating words, especially how the importance of the satellite meteorology. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Professor C. Jagannathan, but somehow is he? Yeah, I'm there. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm Professor, there. Yeah. Professor C. Jagannathan, sir. Uh, sir has been working in the field of RSGIS for the last 30 years and specializes in geostatistics, downscaling, space-time dynamics of vegetation and spatial decision modeling. He has worked in ISRO IRS Dehradun at various scientific positions as well as at the University of Southampton, UK. He has backed the prestigious Class and Big Awardee from ITC Netherlands. He is also an awardee of Indian National Geospatial Awardee from the in Indian Society of Remote Sensing. Personally, I feel privileged to share the same department as he is also recipient of INSA Teacher Award in 2020. Currently, he is professor in the, our Department of Remote Sensing and Dean of Research, Innovation and Entrepreneurship of BIT Mesa. Sir, please uh, give some uh, word to, for this uh, online lecture series. Thank you, Dr. Paira. My namaskaram to all the dignitaries and the panelists. I'm humbled to be sure. with you all today. And uh, thank you very much. And I do not want to waste much time because we are already uh, lagging behind the schedule. Just a few words about BAT. Uh, Birla Institute of Technology was established in 1955. And uh, it has been 68 years. And the institute has been consistently contributing to the national development as well as to the technology development for the global benefit. And the point of remote sensing was established in 1997. So it's a silver jubilee year. And uh, we are very happy to be part of this great effort by SAMA, South Asian Meteorological Association. My congratulations to all the team and uh, my humble thanks and uh, to all the experts who agreed to deliver a talk in this series. And uh, also my thanks to all the participants who have eagerly joined from all the different countries across the globe. Uh, with this short message, I wish all the best to this uh, online lecture series. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, sir. So, sir, please be uh, here for uh, this whole meeting. If it would yes, be I will be us. there. Yeah, it would yes, be there for be. us. Uh, now, let's uh, we invite uh, Dr. R.C. Bhatia, sir. He is the chairman of this lecture series in advisory panel as well. Uh, Sri RC Bhatia, Dr. R.C. Bhatia served IMD for more than 36 years and retired as additional director general in December uh, 2008. He is also permanent representative of India with the WMO and was elected as a member of the executive council. He has played a leading role in planning for all insert series of satellites and establishment of ground segment facilities for the meteorological application program, 
we'll go all the details. Uh, his lecture is in the next week. Uh, before uh, completing, before uh, inviting sir, I would also like to mention he has a significant contributor in establishment of Doppler weather radar network in the IMD. So that was one of the major uh, importance for the uh, metrology subject. So sir, uh, welcome and please uh, speak something about today's program and our online lecture series. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Swagta. And my namaskar to everybody, all the senior people who are present here and the members of the SAMA team and participants in this course. Now, when we had the first meeting of uh, SATMED committee more than a year back, and there were presentation from the member countries uh, outside India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and so on. And uh, we found that uh, there are some, some countries who do not have adequate information, adequate facilities for reception of data. And uh, we found that there is a need for training. And afterwards, we prepared a questionnaire and sent to the member countries of the of SAMA. And based on their response, we have we, we did our best to meet requirements of every country. And we designed a curriculum for uh, giving specific talks by the experts. And in this task, my team members, other team members have contributed quite a lot for finalizing the syllabus. And they have come forward to give talks on different subjects. And I hope that during this course of five or six months, when we go through the training period, we will be able to do our best and deliver maximum information to the participant. They will get benefited. I hope that this goes well and all the participants get full benefit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, we are also looking for uh, next week's your that uh, initial talk Yes. Yeah, about overview of the satellite metrology and its applications. Right, right. So now I called uh, Dr. Sunita Bharma to introduce uh, Kelkar sir. Uh, so Dr. Sunita Bharma, please, uh, you can share the slide and can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to introduce Dr. Ranjan Ratnakar Kelkar. Uh, as everyone is aware, Dr. Ranjan Ratnakar Kelkar is the former Director General of Metallurgy, DGM India, Metallurgical Department. Dr. Kelkar heads of IMD in different capacities for 38 years, including as DGM IMD from 1998 to 2003 before his retirement. Uh, Dr. Kelkar has received his bachelor, master's, and doctoral degrees in physics from Pune University in India. He has also taught satellite metallurgy at the postgraduate level in Pune University. Dr. Kelkar is also author of more than 60 research papers published in peer-reviewed journals. He has also written three books on a satellite metallurgy and several books on weather, climate, and spirituality. He is the permanent representative of India at the World Metallurgical Organization, Geneva, and a member of its executive council. He was a secretary, vice president, and president of the IMS at different times. He worked as the ISRO chair professor at Pune University from 2004 to 2008. Now he is a freelancer, writer, blogger, and speaker on weather, climate, and spirituality. With this um, uh, brief introduction and inaugural ceremony, uh, I uh, um, uh, tell Dr. Sagat to Welcome, Dr. Ranjan Ratnakar Kerika. Yeah, Deep. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I think it's uh, now complete. So, sir, uh, uh, Dr. Radar Kelkar, sir, please, please start your 
uh, lecture. Yeah. Shall I share uh, my screen at this time? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it is visible, sir. Okay. Yeah, just you need to go to the full slide show. Slide show. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunita, for that uh, nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon to all the online viewers who are uh, logged into this session. Uh, let me start by congratulating Sama on this uh, new endeavor and this uh, new initiative for having a long series of uh, lectures about satellite uh, meteorology. Uh, particularly, I'd like to thank uh, AVM Dr. Tyagi, President of Sama, and uh, Dr. Someshwar Das, uh, the Secretary. Uh, the first slide here show is the slide visible to all people? I think so. Yes, sir. Introduction, yes, sir. To, uh, yes, sir. introduction to meteorological satellites and their application is the topic. And I'm going to present this in three steps. Uh, there, there are three segments of my talk. We'll begin with uh, the importance of satellite meteorology, particularly to the South Asian region. Uh, we'll see how the satellite image can be interpreted. Uh, after that, we'll see how products can be derived from satellite data. Uh, we'll assess the contribution that satellite, uh, satellites have made to weather prediction, uh, application to climate studies, and I'll wind up this talk in a futuristic note. You're all familiar with the geography of South Asia. Uh, it's a unique uh, place, and I think <coughs> it's the geography of extremes. We have some of the tallest mountains of the world in our region. Uh, we have the wettest places on earth in our region. We have two plateaus, one to the north and one to the south. Uh, we have glaciers, deserts, forests, fertile plains, river systems, oceans, and islands. I think you just name it and we have it. Uh, this is the geography of extremes of South Asia in which we live. Uh, it's difficult even to understand the climate of South Asia. It's extremely complex. And we have, because in fact, South Asia is called the land of the monsoons. It brings in heavy rainfall, landslides, floods and droughts. There are two oceans around us. So we have tropical cyclones with the storm surges. There are low pressure systems which move across South Asia from west to east, bringing snowfall and cold waves. We have a desert that uh, results in heat waves and dust storms. And of course, there are local systems like thunderstorms. We are not only finding it difficult to understand the present climate, we are also disturbed by the future worries uh, because we are worried because of climate change if the monsoons will not be as good as they are now, uh, whether the intensity of tropical cyclones will increase in future, whether the number will increase, uh, whether we'll have more heat waves coming in, and so on. So uh, all of these things result in something like a, somewhere to go to find out the answers. And one place where we can go to find out that answers is satellite meteorology. South Asia is actually a very highly populated region of the world. But uh, paradoxically, there are places where you cannot live. And there are many places where you cannot reach. And there are places of dangerous weather where you can't even enter. Uh, and yet, we are required to get observations from these places if you want to understand the climate of South Asia. Satellites give us that information. Satellite meteorology, I'll say, is a relatively new science. It's something like 60 years old. Very new compared to conventional or classical meteorology. And that is because satellite meteorology is a technology-driven science. That technology was the ability to put in artificial satellite in space, uh, which we attained sometime in the 1960s or a little before that. And the first weather satellite was launched by the US on 1st April 1960. The name was TIROS-1. Uh, the acronym TIROS uh, had the letter T, and T stood for television. Because uh, this first weather satellite had a TV camera on board, and it was giving us a live telecast of global weather. Live telecasts are not new for us. We have a live telecast of Wimbledon matches or a football event. But putting a television camera on board a satellite and as the satellite moves around or orbits around the Earth, it was sending a live telecast of global weather. 
but this TV camera uh, on the satellite didn't last long uh, because very soon afterward, the TV cameras on the Tyro satellite were replaced by scanners. Scanners these days are very common. I mean, you enter an office building, yes, you're supposed to get your fingerprint scan or you buy something in the marketplace and there's a QR code which you scan with your mobile so that the bank releases payment. Or there's a document which you'd like to send somebody who get it scanned on a scanner. But uh, at the time of Tyros, scanners were new. And this was new technology which was brought in so that the earth could be scanned from the satellite. So scanning the earth meant that you run your scanner across the whole earth from north to south and uh, from east to west. And for every point that you digitally scan, you got a number. So basically what we got, got was, a, was an array of numbers, uh, but people liked images. And so what was done was that the data uh, was converted to an image. So for every point on earth, which is scanned digitally by the satellite, we get a number. And for that number, we assign a gray shade starting from zero to 255. Zero is black and 255 is white. So what results is that by previously we had a set of numbers, now we have an image. An image looks good. We like images because we want to put them on TV screens. Uh, we want to put them in a poster or we can put it on the cover of a book. So the images are convenient. You can see them at a glance compared to data. What a satellite sees is something that a human eye cannot. That's why we need satellites. Like for example, looking at a cloud, uh, we look up to the sky and what we can see is the base of the cloud. But what a satellite, when it looks at the cloud, it looks from space and it sees the top of the cloud. So we have different perspectives of looking at the same thing. Like for example, in the TV debate, there's a single problem and there are a lot of people arguing about it. And everybody sees that particular problem in a different light. In the same way, weather is seen in a different perspective from space and from ground. That's why we need satellites which see something differently. Visible light, uh, as the human eye sees, is usually seven colors. We see them in a rainbow, and we know the formula of Ibgur, violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red. Uh, but uh, what a satellite measures, it measures radiation in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So it can see wavelengths which are longer than red. Uh, it can also see wavelengths which are shorter than blue or violet. The spectrum of electromagnetic radiation was a subject that was taught in physics classrooms till, till recently, I should say. But now we use them every day. Like you tune into an FM station and what you're doing is you're using radio waves. Now you go into the kitchen to warm up your food. What you use is a microwave oven. You have a mobile in your pocket, it's microwave. You get TV channels from the dish, it's microwave. If you're having a problem with your knees, you can heat them up with infrared lamps. Uh, if you look at the rainbow, it's visible. Nowadays, sunscreens have become popular. You use them so that your skin doesn't get affected. If you go to a hospital, chances are that your foot may be x-rayed to find out the bones are intact. And if by any reason there is surgery to be done, the surgeon may use gamma rays, a gamma knife. So nowadays, the whole spectrum of electromagnetic radiation is something that we use all the time. Now what a satellite measures is the same radiation in different parts of the spectrum. So one is the window region in which the atmosphere allows radiation to pass through. And the other is an absorption band in which the gases absorb the radiation and do not allow the radiation to pass through. We come to the satellite orbits. There are different types of orbits in which a satellite can be placed. The most popular orbit is the polar orbit. Uh, the geostationary orbit is also equally popular, and the tropical orbit is something rarely used. So uh, an orbit gives us a vantage point, a different vantage point from different places we can see the weather and the Earth and have a look. The polar orbit uh, crosses the equator twice a day, and in every orbit, every orbital revolution, it sees the polar view in, in every revolution. Now, besides that, the Earth is also rotated within the orbit. So eventually what happens is that we get a global picture over a period of time. 
the geostationary orbit is a special case a special case that the satellite is launched at a height of 36000 kilometers over the equator at that height what happens is that the rotation of the earth matches the revolution of the satellite so everything appears stationary to the satellite relative to the earth and we think the, sat the satellite is stationary so we get a continuous earth view from 60 degrees north to 60 degrees south and the polar regions are not seen by geostationary satellite so if you have five or six such satellites you can see the whole whole globe except for the polar regions with every satellite there's a trade-off there's nothing like a perfect satellite which gives you everything you have to pick and choose between satellites or have many satellites if you want to have everything wavelength is the satellite payload which decides what you can see resolution the sensitivity of the sensor will decide how clearly you can see. ground coverage the satellite altitude and orbit will decide how much area you can see repetitivity the satellite orbit decides how often you can see. So these are the things that you want to have, uh, but you can't have them in one particular satellite because it's impossible to make a satellite with that kind of payload or to place it in an orbit which will give you all of those things. So every satellite launch or every satellite design is a compromise. If you just happen to look at a satellite image randomly, uh, a single isolated image, the first thing you see, there are bright white spots. So we look at now how satellite images can be interpreted. Sometimes you see long bands of clouds, which are indicative of jet streams flowing in the atmosphere. Sometimes you may see spirals, which will tell you that there are tropical cyclones in the vicinity. Uh, you may have a look at the comma-shaped cloud, which are representative of the extratropical system. If you have multiple images, taken at the same time, but in different channels, uh, we can find out what type of cloud it is. Uh, we can also estimate the height of the cloud. And we can also get an estimate of the moisture in the atmosphere. But if you have successive images over a long period of time in different channels, uh, we can get the vertical development of local severe storms. And we can also monitor the horizontal movement of tropical cyclones, uh, monsoon depressions, and Western disturbances, which keep moving horizontally. For doing all these things, you need an imager. Uh, and an INSAT 3D imager has six channels. INSAT stands for the Indian National Satellite, and three stands for the third generation. And INSAT 3D has six channel imagers. Uh, one is the visible channel, uh, one in the shortwave IR, one in the midwave IR. Uh, two in the thermal infrared, and one in the water vapor absorption band. The resolutions go from one kilometer in the visible to eight kilometers in the water vapor channel. If you ever look at these channels at the same time, you'll get three different types of pictures. Uh, the one on the left is the visible channel image, almost like what we will see, we would see if we are sitting in the satellite and looking down. There's a yellow line across the, the, the Earth's disk, and it separates the sunlit part from the non-sunlit part. So a satellite in the visible channel can see anything which is which has sunlight available on that particular region. An infrared uh, window uh, image uh, can, can throw, can make an image any time of the day. It doesn't depend on the on sunshine. Uh, it's basically a measure of the temperature. And the water vapor band uh, image uh, gives you moisture, the amount of moisture in the atmospheric column, now, this is also available 24 hours of the day. Now, this is a cutout from a, from a full disk or a sector of INSAT 3D taken very recently, 10th of August uh, this year, at noon time, Indian Standard Time. Uh, and this is a visible sector. And you can see here that the oceans appear black because the ocean don't reflect solar radiation. And the land appears gray. And there are clouds which are kind of uh, gray shaded, which are middle level clouds. And there are tall clouds which appear white. So this is what you will see in a visible channel sector. Same time, same date. If you take an infrared uh, picture, 
something different happens. Now the hot areas appear black because the temperature comes in. The oceans appear gray and some of the tallest clouds, they appear white. This is the third alternative, the water vapor channel image for the same time and same day. Your things are very different. The monsoon has set in, it is active and you have moisture everywhere. So only in the Northwestern region of South Asia, we have a blackish grayish uh, sector where everything else is gray and white. There are two pictures here, which are taken at the same time on 19th July afternoon. Uh, we have a visible image and an infrared image and they look similar, but actually they're a bit different. Both are showing bright white spots because in the visible you have a reflecting cloud and in the infrared you have a tall cloud. Both, both clouds of course are the same and they all look visible, visibly white in, in the image. So you can look at thunderstorms. Uh, tropical cyclones of course are uh, very easy to pick out in a satellite picture. The first one is cyclone Biperjoy, uh, which was over the Arabian Sea, 12th of June, this picture was taken. And uh, it fizzled out or made a landfall uh, on the Pakistan-India border. Uh, the other one is uh, cyclone Boka of 13th May, 2023, this year, uh, on the way of Bengal. And it uh, dissipated on the Bangladesh-Myanmar border. So this throws a pattern. And the moment you see a pattern in a satellite image, you can immediately say, look, this is a tropical cyclone. Now the pattern consists of a central dense overcast, which is white, uh, the eye, which is grayish or blackish, and there are spider webs. So this way we can identify systems in a particular pattern. Uh, this is a picture of uh, winter fog, rather old picture, 2016 picture, inside 3D. This is in the visible channel. In the infrared channel, a fog cannot be noticed because the temperature is almost as good as the temperature of the earth. But in the visible channel, the, the reflection is, is different. And we can see this fog stretching all the way along the foothills of the Himalayas from central northern India to Bangladesh. Uh, this is a picture of Himalayan snow, uh, taken not by an Indian satellite, but by a US satellite. Uh, NASA Terra satellite with an instrument called MODIS. And the image was uh, dated 20 November 2015. Uh, snow is cold and snow is also highly reflecting, so it appears white. So it's very easy to, for, to spot snow uh, on a satellite picture. Now, this is a, a series of four images taken in 2016 in January, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And you can see a comma-shaped cloud entering into the picture. Uh, this is a, a, an image of uh, what is called a Western disturbance, which uh, these kind of disturbances, they kind of uh, appear over the Mediterranean Sea first. And from there, they keep on traveling eastwards day to day over uh, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and finally into India and outside, out of India. So you can see here that every day this uh, system is progressing eastwards and bringing weather along with it to different parts of South Asia. This is a picture of the monsoon, not the recent one, but an older one, 2017. And the reason why I'm showing this, this is a water vapor channel picture uh, taken on 18th of May. 18th of May is much before the cyclone advances into South Asia. Uh, but you can actually see from the water vapor channel the buildup of moisture ahead of the onset. And you can see the gray and white band stretching across uh, the equatorial region into tropical convergence zone and the blackish area, which is totally dry, where the monsoon is still far away. So, in this way, there are various ways of uh, interpreting satellite images. It needs experience and it needs uh, a systematic study. But as I said in the beginning, that images are not made by a satellite, they're made by us. And basically we have the data from which we make the images. So data itself can be used and many products can be derived from the satellite data. First of all, it, it should be clear that visible and whatever channels can be used only qualitatively because they are not calibrated. But an IR channel is calibrated with respect to the temperature. And we can derive basically three things Cloud top temperature, uh, the sea surface temperature, and the temperature of the atmosphere. 
And you can see in this image, there are red isotopes which show minus 80 degrees Celsius where cloud tops have reached and there are blue ones which are minus 60, which are some of the lower clouds. Sea surface temperature is a rather uh, straightforward application of satellite data. What we do is to use the Stephen Boltzmann law and make an inverse application. And the temperature can be obtained from the radiance in the thermal infrared window reaching the satellite. So what these radiance gives us by, by inversion is the skin SST or the topmost uh, surface of the, of the ocean. But for getting this, you need a clear sky. Otherwise, you won't look at this ocean, you'll look at the cloud top. So there are attenuation and contamination errors uh, caused by the intervening atmosphere and intervening clouds. And they have to be removed by using multi-channel algorithms. So there are problems, but in general, we, get a, we can make a good use of the sea surface temperature uh, across the world because uh, the only way to get sea surface temperature before satellites came was to use them from ships or from buoys. Now we have a global picture of the sea surface temperature. This particular map was taken on 9th of August uh, this year. And you can see within the, the black boundary, El Nino developing on the coast of uh, South America and stretching westwards towards the Indian Ocean. So we can, in fact, El Nino monitoring is basically with satellite data. When you look at the sky, you, you'll see clouds floating in the atmosphere. Some of them are randomly there, while some you can see that they're carried by the wind. Uh, the same principle is applied in with satellites. You can, if you have a geostationary satellite with uh, consecutive half hourly images, you just pick up a cloud in a certain time image. Let's say it was at position A and take a picture half an hour later and trying to figure out where that particular cloud has gone. Let's say it has gone to a place B. Measure the distance from A to B, divide by 30 minutes, which is the time between two satellite scans and you get your wind. So it's almost something like we look at, a, look at the sky ourselves and find out where the wind is blowing from. So these features are called tracers. They can be identified and tracked across successive images. So we can get a map like this. In this particular image, which was 17th of August this year, the one was active. And there are these blue wind bars, which are upper level easterlies over the tropics. And there are the pinkish yellowish wind bars, which are upper level westerlies over the extra tropics. Cloud motion winds are liable to severe errors because between half an hour, a cloud may change its shape. Uh, it may descend or ascend. And several clouds may look exactly alike as happens when we look at the sky ourselves. So a lot of quality control is required to eliminate these kind of spurious winds. It's also difficult to assign a height to the cloud wind because we have to plot it on a synoptic chart and we don't know exactly where it can be done. Outgoing long wave radiation is something which is very important because as we, we know, uh, our only source of energy is from the sun. And uh, that has to be ultimately sent back by the atmosphere and the earth. If it is not sent back, we get global warming and we know what's happening with that. So what we need to know is uh, the outgoing long wave radiation or the OLR. This actually is a broadband parameter. If you can see this blue band, it stretches from four microns to 80 microns. While what a satellite measures is an, in the narrow radiance range of 10 microns to 12 microns. So we try to estimate from the narrow band, something which is in the broad band. Physically, it's not very correct, but statistically we can do that. And we're able to get OLR in watts per meter square for the entire global scene. This is a OLR map for 12th of July. And if you can see a little, Clearly, OLR less than 240 meters square, which is colored blue, uh, is the monsoon area and the tropical area, which is convection, where convection is active. And the brown area is something like 300 to 320 watts per meter square, which are deserts or where there is hardly any convection. So what happens is we can, in fact, estimate precipitation, large scale precipitation from the OLR measurements. And OLR less than 240 watts per meter square, we can say is a rainy region. And lower the OLR, higher the precipitation. This is an estimate. But actually, you can put an instrument on board and measure the precipitation from a satellite. Now, this is done in two ways. One is you can have a microwave channel 
radiometer or you can measure it by an onboard radar. It's very easy to understand this because many times when we are watching a, a TV channel and it is raining somewhere, you get a message that the, that the image is, is disturbed or, or missing because of rain. So a microwave uh, radiation is affected very badly by rain. And if you measure the microwave radiation, we can actually compute the precipitation involved. This is a map uh, of global precipitation for the month of July. July was a good month where it was raining quite a lot. And this, uh, this is for the whole month. And this estimate is from what is called the special sector microwave imager. It's on a US satellite. Uh, the blue and green regions are the rainy areas. You can see that they are a little to the north of the equator and the whole of South Asia is getting good rains. This was in July. There are many ways of measuring precipitation, not necessarily from the OLR or from other little instrument. There's an entire mission devoted to global precipitation measurement, which is called the GPM. Uh, this actually is a network of satellites. And there is one central satellite, which is made by United States and Japan together. And there are other partner countries which are providing a network. Now, the main satellite is, was launched in 2014. It's still working at an altitude of 400 kilometers, and it covers the Earth from 65 north to 65 south. Now, this has two instruments. One is the GPM microwave imager, and the other is the dual frequency precipitation radar. What we get from this is maps like this. This was our 20th of July when the monsoon was active over South Asia. And you can see the red and brown spots, which are the maximum rainy areas. And the pink, of course, is, is, is a dry region. So we can get maps like these almost on a real-time basis from the GPM mission, uh, covering, of course, 65 degrees north to south. But there is one rather complicated uh, extraction of parameters, which is the vertical temperature and humidity soundings. I'm not going to into details of this. I'm sure somebody else will be covering it later. But what happens is that whatever energy is received and absorbed by the, by the ground has to be ultimately sent back. And if you can imagine that the atmosphere is made of several layers, every layer receives something from below and emits something above. Now, if you have a sounder, it's possible to find out by, again, an in inverse process, what, what how, and how much of every layer has contributed to the, to the radiance going to the satellite. And from that, by inverting things, we can get the temperature of each layer and its humidity. This is extremely important and useful because, as you know, radio sounds uh, are balloon-borne instruments. And every time a balloon is sent up, the balloon bursts and the instrument falls down somewhere, it is lost. So radio sounds are expensive and, and they are inconvenient. Not only that, you can't put radio sounds over the ocean. So a satellite gives you what a radio sound does on land, a satellite does for you over the oceans. So for this, InSat 3D has a 19-channel sounder. All of them have a resolution of 10 kilometers. And there are 19 channels in different uh, parts of the spectrum, shortwave IR, midwave IR, longwave IR, and the visible. So with all of these things, what really have satellites done to weather prediction? Well, they have several advantages. We know that very well. But the main advantage was that before satellites came into existence, uh, everything was a long process which was done quite a lot manually. The data had to be collected, data had to be plotted on the chart, and the charts had to be analyzed by human beings and, and so on. Now, when satellite pictures came in, you just got everything at a glance. You don't have to plot something or analyze something. You see the whole weather at a glance. And basically, areas which were not having conventional observation, that it was not possible to take observation, were all seen in that global image. But the main thing that has happened in recent years, which is a very significant advancement, is that uh, a simulation of data into numerical weather prediction models now includes a simulation from satellite radiances. Radiances are not converted data. They are the data original sources of data which reach the satellite. We don't derive anything from that. So these radiances, if they are assimilated into the models in real time, some of the errors which are going along with the satellite products are no longer involved. 
And this has made a significant advancement in the accuracy of numerical weather prediction models and their forecast. So this, I'll say, is one of the important things that satellites have done to weather prediction. Right now, there are something like 16 geostationary satellites and 12 polar orbiting satellites orbiting around the world for meteorological application. Now, there's a Japanese satellite named Himawari. Uh, it's located at 140.7 degree east. And if you see the full disk, uh, South Asia is to the extreme west. It's in the yellow box. There's also a Chinese satellite, FY4B, which is at 123.5 degrees east. And if you see the yellow box, the South Asian region is in the northwest quadrant of this image. Uh, there is a Meteosat, which is a European satellite. It's called IODC, Indian Ocean Data Coverage. Uh, and uh, if you see this, South Asia is to the extreme east. But if you see INSAT, the Indian National Satellite System, third generation, South Asia is ideally located in the center of the disk. Uh, there is no distortion of the map. There is no geographical distortion. And the images... Uh, and uploaded to the IMD's uh, website, mausam.imd.gov.in, and every half an hour these images are uploaded. INSAT-3D is an operational satellite at 82 degrees east, and INSAT-3D-R is a backup satellite at 74 degrees east. So one of the two are always available, and the images are uploaded to the website. We come to the fifth part of this talk, application to climate studies. Uh, as we saw at the beginning that the first weather satellite was launched in 1960, almost 63 years since satellites started giving us data. So we now have a long series of archived satellite data from which we should be able to find out results about uh, climate change. Now, this is a boon as well as a problem. The problem is this, that with every new satellite, the instruments have become better. The data is more accurate than before. It is covering regions which were not previously seen by certain satellites. So there are internal incompatibilities in a long series of satellite data. And you have to make adjustments to the accuracies and the resolution. It's not easy. In, in recent years, of course, many satellites are on par. But in the olden days, some of the satellites were not that much on par. So uh, in spite of that, there have been seven, several applications uh, where satellites have been used because, again, everywhere satellites are the only source of information. So we have had two major projects. One was the ICCP, which was the International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project. The other was GPCP, the Global Precipitation Climatology Project, in which uh, meteorological satellite data was used for getting a lot of information over the years, and we have averaged map, we have normals, we have seasonal, and things like that. But notwithstanding the meteorological satellites, there are at least five satellites which are meant specifically for climate studies. And there are five of them which I would like to name here. Uh, one is the OCO2, or the Orbiting Carbon Observatory. Uh, we have seen uh, the Mauna Loa, Hawaii maps of carbon dioxide how CO2 has been increasing from for the last 50 years, and they're very scary maps. But that is at a single point. While an, an orbiting carbon observatory gives us, this is a NASA satellite, it gives us uh, the sources and sinks of CO2 all over the Earth. It's good to know where the CO2 is being absorbed and where it is being emitted. It, it's a nice source of information. Then we have a US-European jointly produced satellite called JSON-3. This is an altimeter. You know what, what an altimeter is? I mean, when you are flying on an aircraft, many times the pilot will announce, look, we are flying at 30,000 feet. How does he know that? Well, he has an altimeter on board. And similarly, an altimeter on a satellite uh, will tell us where the sea level is, whether it is changing, or it is increasing or, or what. And JSON-3 does it with an accuracy of three centimeters. It's an extremely accurate measurement. Now, there are two instruments which are used for ozone monitoring. They measure the ultraviolet and visible radiation. One is called the GOM-2, Global Ozone Monitoring Experiment. Uh, the other is Ozone Mapping and Profiler Suite. Now, one is on a European satellite, METOP. The other is on a NOAA 20 US satellite. So they are giving us maps of ozone concentration in the atmosphere, particularly for finding out the ozone pole and its extent. 
Ocean Sat 3 is the fifth in the, in, on this slide. It's an ISRO satellite, uh, which is in operation. This is uh, three instruments on board. One is for measurement of uh, ocean color. The other is for measurement of surface wind over the ocean. And the third for the sea surface temperature. So these are some of the climate application satellites which are operational right now. But in future, and this is the last point in my talk, what does the future hold for us? That's a question. There are at least four new missions which are being planned for weather and climate. And I think we should know a little about it. So I have four slides for each of these uh, bullets. Tropics is, a, is an acronym for, it's not actually a geographical name tropics, it's an acronym for time resolve observations of precipitation structure and storm intensity with a constellation of small satellites. This is an evolving program of NASA, and the object is to get soundings of tropical cyclones at hourly intervals. Uh, a small sat is, is a really a small satellite, the size of which is 36 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and the weight is five kilograms. It's something like holding a small box in your hand. And you can imagine that the inclination is 30 degrees, the altitude is 550 degrees. It has a 12 channel passive microwave spectrometer, and it will give you a slice of a tropical cyclone at hourly. So these are small satellites capable of doing big things. This is a program which will be coming in the near future. There's one more satellite called PACE. This is an acronym for Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem. This is also a NASA mission. It's scheduled for launch in 2024, and it has an ocean color instrument. It has two multi-angle polarimeters, and it measures almost everything. It measures energy, water, nutrients, gases, aerosols, and pollutants. So this is something that's going to give us a lot of information on a lot of things. And in fact, aerosols are one quantity which uh, cause a lot of uncertainty in climate modeling. So if you know more about aerosols, uh, modeling will be surely better. Sentinel is a European satellite series to be launched next year onwards. That again is an altimeter. It has uh, measurements of sea surface height, significant wave height, surface wind speed, and sea ice height and thickness. Uh, it has also got instruments for ocean color monitoring and for the sea surface temperature. The last in the series is a satellite called NISA. And NISA stands for NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar. This is to be launched in January next year from Trieri Kota, India. And it has two radars, an S-band and an L-band radar. And it will produce images of the Earth's surface with a resolution of one centimeter, a really fine resolution compared to all of the satellites. And the application areas are many. Uh, it will see the melting of glaciers and ice masses. Uh, it will monitor the sea level rise. It will check groundwater levels. It will find out what's happening to ecosystems, forests, wetlands, and even get some inkling into the dynamics of earthquakes and volcanoes. This is almost my last satellite. It's interesting to know that in the last five months, almost 10 satellites have been launched to monitor weather and climate. It's good for us. And in the month of May this year, the US uh, NASA launched four satellites in the tropics series. Uh, which will give us uh, information on tropical cyclones. In April, China launched uh, FY3G satellite, which is a GPM constellation member. It will give us information on precipitation. China also launched a satellite FY3F uh, this August. It has an imager and a sounder. Uh, in June, Russia launched the Meteor M, which has an imager. And interestingly, private companies have launched three satellites. One is called Ghost 3, it has a hyperspectral. Uh, Imager, a satellite named Tomorrow. Tomorrow is the name of the satellite. It is measuring precipitation, and a satellite called Vocondor has a synthetic aperture radar. So these were launched, 10 of them, in the last few months. So it indicates how much interest people have in this. This is my last slide, which says that the future is good. Satellites have become indispensable, as we have seen, for weather forecasting and climate studies. We just can't do without them anymore. Uh, they give us uh, global coverage. Uh, they give us information that no other source provides us. And good to know that most operational satellites have backups ready. So we, we will not be lost if a satellite is lost. And several new missions are coming up. 
Uh, so there is a great potential for the use of satellite data for the South Asian region uh, for reasons that we are not able to monitor the whole of this region by conventional observations. And satellites are something which fill the gap. And at the beginning of this session, Dr. Tyagi mentioned that satellite meteorology has to be given more importance. He said that, and I say that again, that after climate change and numerical weather modeling, satellite meteorology has been rather given a backseat. It needs to be pulled to the front row again. So with that little comment, I complete my talk. And thank you for listening to me and also my best wishes uh, to people in South Asia. And they have a choice of satellite. They have a lot of information available online and they can certainly use it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, sir. It's really satellite is indispensable for coming weather forecasting. Just giving an, one example in 1999, when that cyclone was happened, uh, that whole Odisha was, you know, massacre on that time. I was student. I asked actually that that time meteorological department. They said, yeah. whatever they put as a radar leader, whatever they put due to that cyclone, everything was you know, washed away. So later I realized that satellite actually, the advantage of the satellite. So now the cyclone forecast each and everything is much more perfect. Thank you, sir. So uh, now we can you. close your uh, yeah. uh, PPT. I'm trying to do that. Yeah. And uh, sir, there will be a question and answer after the talk of Dr. Rajkumar Sharma, sir. So uh, for that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Mili Ghosh, ma'am, uh, for introducing Dr. Rajkumar Sharma, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, one one, ma'am. Uh, yeah. First, uh, we need to. And thanks also, sir. I also main, maintained the time very well. So I would also like to request uh, Dr. Rajkumar, sir, if you could maintain the time, there would be a better question and answer session, and that would be more interactive as the inaugural program. Yeah, mainly, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. yeah what, about the, what about the photo session as mentioned in the agenda? Uh, photo session, actually. Uh, Usually we're doing the meeting here. We can do that right now. This would be the better. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. Let so please, can... uh, please switch on the camera, everyone. And uh, ma'am, uh, don't share now. Ma'am, uh, close. Stop sharing. Uh, so please, everyone, switch on their camera. So we'll take a screenshot. We say, please stop sharing the slide. Yeah, yeah. Or... Just, just. Kinsha need to stop. Okay, I'm. I could close it. But yeah, yeah. Then, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. So, Dr. Deepa Prakash, you are not online. And Dr. Sunita Bharma, Dr. Me Chin Chow. So, if you could online, if you. Could switch on the camera, very good. And uh, TV Lakshmi Kumar. Lakshmi, maybe Lakshmi was not aware that there will be a photo session. Is there in the agenda? <laughs> yeah, it was not in the agenda. No, it is uh, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yes, yes. Uh, so, Dr. Mohan, so do that. Needful. I think it is done. I can. Yeah. So uh, now, oh, uh, Rathor sir came. So yeah, can you do one more? Rathor sir, Namaskar and welcome. Rathor sir. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I will start with the beginning. Yeah, I have seen, but that time it was already started. Uh, so uh, Sunita and Dr. Meech, uh, can you switch on your camera once more? Yeah, it is done. Thank you. So uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Mili Ma'am uh, for introducing Dr. Rajkumar Sharma sir for a talk of a brief history of ISRO space and satellite mission. Thank, thank you, sir.
thank you sir for giving me this opportunity uh, dr rajkumar is presently professor satish dhawan scientist at space application center ahmedabad isro after his super annotation from the post of director national remote sensing center hyderabad isro in february 2022 he is actively involved in mentoring young scientists for cutting edge science and applications with space born sensors and involved in reviewing several ongoing and upcoming application projects he began his career with isro after his masters in physics and over the years has held several key positions within the organization his expertise in the field of remote sensing and gis technology has made him a respected figure in the scientific community and has made significant contribution to the development of remote sensing technology in india prior to his tenure as director and rsc and as deputy director in space application center ahmedabad isro he had been instrumental in launching long term programs in various disciplines of earth system science studies such as hydrology atmosphere ocean cryosphere agriculture and geosciences he has more than 125 publications in peer reviewed journals of international repute and has also supervised more than 10 young researchers and is still guiding young scientists for their phd he is the recipient of various prestigious awards like satish dhawan award bikram sarabhai award professor p r pisotri award memorial award and isro team excellence award dr rajkumar played key role in propelling collaborations with international space agencies in remote sensing and also represented isro in international committee on earth observation satellites and was co-chair of cios coast he has been science lead of isro nasa joint nisa project dr rajkumar has played a major role in the professional society as president of indian meteorological society ahmedabad chapter member of national committee of IMS chairman of Indian Society of Remote Sensing Ahmedabad chapter and also served as president of Indian Society of Geomatics thanks a lot sir now it's over to you dr swagata uh, thank you ma'am yeah i am uh, stop i am stopping yeah, yeah. Uh, now we are eagerly waiting to listen the lecture a brief history of isro space and satellite mission uh, dr rajkumar sir stage is yours So we all are uh, waiting for your exciting lectures. Sir, you are mute. Sir, still you are mute. Yeah. Yeah. Now it is fine. Yeah, I was just trying to share my screen. <laughs> so you are still uh, not able to see my screen or no? No. no. I think oh, just yes. yeah, just I think I may have to do something else. Oh, oh, I think it will ask me to quit and reopen. Oh, oh. I have to quit on what? What? I, I did not see that time. You oh, have to quit or maybe? No, no. And I don't. There is one green button, sir, in the bottom. You can see. No, no, I, I, I shared, but it is telling a. I think it was asking some preferences. It was asking that time. I tried. No, yeah, can you make uh, make him close, close the button. PowerPoint and then reopen it? Yeah, uh, yeah. It is coming, sir. It is coming. It is coming now. It has come. It has come. It has come. Your screen fine, fine. has your. Yeah, yeah, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Now you make it full screen. Yeah, I made it. Yeah, so now you can see, is it? Yeah, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, sir, no. Sorry for the mistake. Oh, no, sir, it's an excuse. Yeah. So, uh, good afternoon to all uh, seniors as well as the, all young researchers. Uh, Dr. Kelkar has already talked uh, very nicely about uh, the space one remote sensing as well as satellite meteorology, which is a uh, uh, key of this uh, SAMA program. So, I will just talk about that. What is the ISRO's uh, space missions uh, earlier? What how we started uh, a little bit of genesis of the space missions. and when then uh, presentations uh, or what you will have it going in. so as all of you know uh, you have seen all these pictures uh, uh, nowadays more and more uh, after the launch of uh, chandrayaan 3 uh, because how we started our journey 
uh, on a bicycle you see some uh, very <laughs> pictures uh, that people are going on the bicycle taking rocket uh, and that these are the very very early things uh, and then uh, we started with the many communication satellites uh, uh, earthbound uh, satellites uh, remote sensing uh, many uh, land remote sensing ocean remote sensing as dr kelkar was talking talking about that uh, atmospheric remote sensing insect type of satellites and then uh, on the planetary sciences also uh, as uh, we had the chandrayaan 1 chandrayaan 2 and recently chandrayaan 3 also and mars orbiter mission and today uh, we have a mission to the sun uh, aditya one so this was a small journey uh, and this uh, all this is started uh, due to the great uh, dr vikram sarawai who started this uh, space program in india with the main uh, motive of the his uh, uh, starting this program was that we should be second to none in the application of advanced technologies and mainly serving to the real problems of the uh, indian public so that why he started mainly with this if you see uh one antenna this is, uh, that is for communication uh, from the to the public how we can start uh, communicating to the different villages and all those places where there, there is no communication that was the earth systems uh, communication antenna and then uh, one program site was there where we have that program for the tv started and then when we when the right right bottom you see one picture that is also very very popular picture that is uh, and that is some the miss norm also that satellite is going uh, on the bullock cart and then people started that earlier in india was having on the bullock cart satellite was moving <laughs> so this is just miss norm uh, uh, satellite was not on the bullock cart this is the actually was supposed to be some uh, we wanted to have a testing of the antenna uh, that is communication at, uh, what you call it uh, tnt telecommunication and then for communication there are so many uh, testing facility should be there like proper testing facility should be there but that time we uh, it was not there so to avoid all this uh, interferences uh, because uh, uh, if you have any type of uh, automobile or anything different you have different uh, uh, interferences so uh, th this was thought that okay on bullock cart or because there is always uh, mostly on the uh, wooden base so you not have interferences so on that uh, testing was done so this was the story when many people say it was started on the bullock cart but not was the bullock cart this was the oh, <laughs> so this is history. yeah base room base room yeah so uh -huh. yeah as as i told uh, then our journey was mainly started with this uh, site program uh, in 1990 and uh -huh. 1975 76 where uh, we started uh, maybe i'm maybe. just hearing some uh, query query it happens it happens i am having some actually uh, interference uh, some people are talking can people mute hello yeah ah so yeah uh, so we started this uh, just uh, initial picture where you can see uh, professor yashpal uh, great visionary uh, uh, uh program was a structural television experiment as was talk, talking about that how the tele through television uh, we can have this uh, communication as well as the education program so mass communication to the public so we started through that and then we had that uh, through that we started the insect program uh, what uh, dr kelkar was talking about mostly meteorological program is insect but insect started mainly for the communication point of view earlier so we have the insect program for the satellite communication and then mainly for the as i told for the societal development and for societal applications that was the main goal was the, uh, since beginning of the isro and is still going on uh, through the, that uh, overall if you see the indian space program uh, it is mainly uh, full fledged that is transportation wise we have the all this launch vehicle uh, through which you see the starting from the Uh, SLV that is, and then ASLV uh, afterwards polar launch vehicle which you see all the uh, low earth, earth, earth orbiting satellites are going. Uh, then we have a GSLV through, through which we have a heavy satellite for the geostationary orbits. And now we are a reusable, uh, reusable launch vehicle also are being tried, and uh, which will be paved the way for the uh, human space flight also. Uh, it is being tried. So these are the transportation by because so satellite has to be on the orbit. 
so you do, need not to be depend now on the uh, other nations that why space transportation wise infrastructure wise that is all satellite payload and everything for all type of satellite earth observation wise what we call it for uh, mainly societal benefits and communication satellites navigation satellites as well as for the satellites for the space uh, sciences and then uh, for the planetary missions like uh, we have a uh, chandrayaan mars orbiter mission and maybe going for the venus also later time but all those things are uh, uh, what uh, space infrastructure and space transport are mainly for the applications uh, different type of applications uh, uh, earth observation satellite communication applications and navigational application and all those application go for that different different project if you see uh, 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 in the country the development national development projects progress of those how it is going on that can be monitored through that as well as many program for the forecasting many many things are being done so those applications are being also uh, demonstrated through this and then it can it is being uh, given to the respective ministries and they are uh, using it uh, but in between uh, for doing all those things uh, capacity building is also one of the major thing uh, uh, today is the even this uh, sama program is also for the capacity building in the uh, metrology uh, but for our purpose for the space sciences as well as for the space program also capacity building different type of capacity building uh, structure we do uh, through our programs also through our training programs as well as our institute itself uh, we do so everything is uh, encompassing uh, all these things are encompassing in our own space program is the space program i can see the total how uh, uh, till now uh, how many missions we have the then uh, 124 space craft missions are there including all i am talking about uh, uh, earth observation that remote sensing what we call it in the normal term then communication navigation and uh, this uh, planetary science missions also as well as the astrosat mission and today the uh, adit that is 125 uh, through uh, all these missions and the other missions of the other countries also uh, through this uh, what i was talking about transportation systems uh land entity launch missions are the, uh, where they are through this all these launch vehicles I, i talked about and but not only these missions what i was talking about earth observation we have some uh, student satellites also from different universities and uh, many satellites are uh, launched for the other countries also almost 34 countries if i can say uh, 400 satellites including uh, nano and micro satellites also uh, and uh, re recently with the uh, starting of the private players in the uh, coming up so we have realizing uh, satellites for them also uh, as i was talking about uh, this will briefly i talk about that uh, how we started the communication uh, uh, from the uh, in our uh, isro uh, from inset one satellites in the, almost uh, in the 1980s or they call it uh, and the uh, 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 fortunately or we can say i i also joined uh, isro at that time 1983 and then uh, inset was started 1982 and then uh, we have inset 1 series then we are in 90s we have inset 2 series uh, there we have mostly indigenous uh, uh, components and all those things we started building of this uh, inset 2 series that is our own and then comes the, the uh, inset 3 series uh, and that uh, 4 series also that is for the all this communication satellites uh, in the inset 4 series what i talk about 4a 4b 4c and then uh, this uh, naming converter came to the from the inset to the g set series for the communication satellites or geostationary satellites and then uh, when uh, in the 2000 uh, around uh, this uh, yeah to 2000 onwards with the different different advanced technologies that means okay, we have earlier we have very very low bandwidth satellite but after that the high throughput satellites uh, number of beams are more so that we can cover more area as well as the more focus on a particular area also so such type of uh, advancement also we were done uh, in the communication and are being done similarly for navigation as, as we know uh, we have the irns satellite series where we have seven satellites uh, which are covering mainly for the navigation purpose uh through the geosynchronous as well as the geostationary satellites covering all those so that we can have better navigation uh, for the various purpose uh, uh, like uh, railways as well for the maritime like fisheries and for surveys also so we have that uh, uh, navigational satellite constellation also of our own 
लाइक अर्लियर ऑल दिस कंट्रीज आर हैविंग जीपीएस नेटवर्क पे भी है कॉल इट नाविक हाउ Uh, but uh, from the point of view when we are talking about that uh, sama uh, mostly i will be talking about that uh, remote sensing satellite uh, but that is matlab earth observation satellite for the land ocean atmosphere this they started mostly uh, i can say from this uh, series of the bhaskara one satellite which was in 1979 bhaskara one satellite was there earth observation satellite very simple uh, two uh, sensor was there one is a television camera but another one uh, which is uh, for the atmospheric science was uh, bhaskara one which is samir uh, we were uh, calling it very frequently samir one was there which is having 19 and 22 gigahertz uh, as a uh, most of us may be knowing uh, 19 gigahertz very very important from the water vapor point of view as well as the liquid water uh, content point of view so these were the simple two channels in the bhaskara one uh, and now uh, two years itself we had the uh, one more channel was uh, added is in the 31 gigahertz also uh, in this time. so bhaskara 2 was launched in uh, 1981 so these were a simple satellite first uh, satellite from the uh, earth observation if we call it uh, these were there uh, experimental also we can say these uh, satellites uh, however when we go for the operational uh, remote sensing satellite series then uh, started series uh, from the irs indian remote sensing satellite series it was started in 1988 uh from the first satellite is uh, iris 1a which is uh, having uh, sensors uh, for the earth observation uh, we were calling it uh, lis1 lis2 lis3 type of sensor basically lis1 lis2 lis3 depending upon the what uh, resolutions we are having uh, lis1 is having around uh, 70 meter resolution lis2 is uh, half of that 36 meter uh, resolution as well as uh, lis3 is a uh, still uh, better resolution so like that we have a irs series of satellites 1a 1b 1c 1d like uh, we started in addition to that we uh, started having a very wide field sensors also in between uh, in uh, uh, not only the list sensors uh, that is a wide field sensor but with the coarser resolution i will come upon that and uh, pan- panchromatic uh, result uh, type of uh, sensors also which is having the almost uh, resolution of the 6 meter so all this satellite we started with the starting by the told list uh, list one list two list three and a bit etc the if you the beauty of this is we have the almost uh, three tire imaging uh, you can have this starting from the list three list four i recall as i talk about the uh, six meter resolution that means the very 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 fine resolution then we go to the coarser resolution with the list three with a bit we have a 56 meter resolution so if you want to see any particular uh, region uh, for different uh, i'll come on that like this if you see uh, uh, this uh, slide uh, just for example uh, for the crop point of which is the one of the major application we call it for the agriculture uh, we can have the from the very very high resolution now uh, afterwards we had the cartosat series also uh, the centimeter resolution so uh, you can have that cartosat series uh, very uh, very very high resolution then uh, same area uh if you want to monitor maybe not uh, uh, carto set type of satellite you cannot have very very uh, regular monitoring very uh, frequent monitoring because the repeat cycle uh, is uh, less and the area coverage is uh, less then you, that can be done through list four of satellites or if you want to the more coarser or some of our top resolution you don't need very high resolution can be the list three and uh, something more with the more, more coarser with the wide field sensor avis what we call it a uh, 56 meter and then uh, inset series of satellite for the most uh, mostly for the uh, very very coarser resolution kilometer scale when we call it for earth observation point of view it looks a very very coarse resolution uh, but for uh, atmospheric and ocean sciences this is the resolution uh, is being uh, normally talked kilometer resolution so inset series of satellites so all type of uh, you can see uh, uh, satellite series uh, can be used for different different purposes like uh, in the bottom you see uh, avis is used for mainly for the, the temporal behavior of the uh, any particular area for the if you want to snow area or for land area or for the crop uh, you want to see the monitoring frequent monitoring so that can be done so these are the purpose of the different different type of uh, satellite series uh, overall capability wise as i was talking about you have the resource set series uh, which is the list one list two list three then we have a carto set series with the Carto set one was there with the stereo uh, capability, so that you can add them also. Not only the uh, two dimension, but the 
Sidamister them also we can have. And Carto set two series, which is started with the uh, uh, centimeter scale uh, resolution. So this is the mainly for the uh, resource mapping, I, I say. Uh, and then for weather and climate point of view, as uh, Professor Kilker talked a lot about that, inset three series, inset 3D, 3DR, and uh, we will be having inset 3DS also uh, this year itself, uh, similar to 3D and 3DR. Uh, in between, we have a uh, megatropics. Uh, this I, I'll just uh, come upon this uh, also uh, briefly uh, from the uh, atmospheric point of view. And then ocean uh, series, we have ocean set two, ocean set three, uh, and uh, with the French, we have the uh, Saral uh, uh, altimeter, which is uh, for the mainly for the ocean point of view for the climate change uh, sea level uh, monitoring, very very high resolution and uh, centimeter scale. Uh, uh, so basically, if you uh, want to have the sense remote sensing, uh, there are two type of uh, sensing called the one is the optical, uh, where we have the visible uh, NIR uh, or near infrared as the IR we can say, or the short wave infrared. These type of sensors are there. Other one is the microwave. Basically, these two uh, type of sensors are are there. In optical remote sensing, uh, as I told, we started with 1988 with the sensor of the IRS type of series was there. With the if you see that uh, how the resolution has changes uh, as well as the swath has uh, increased started increasing uh, from the uh, time period when we started in the eighties and now you can see we are going over with, with the Carto set series which is very very high resolution even uh, swath also are being increased so uh, depending upon the what type of uh, applications we want to do for the Earth observation uh, these are the number of uh, satellites uh, have been uh, there uh, from the ISRO side. In microwave, uh, we call it the different uh, type of uh, systems. One is the passive systems, which are the radiometers, which don't have their own energy. Uh, so we started with Bhaskara, as I told, Bhaskara 179, sorry, 79, 81 was there. Then we have Oceanset 1 series, which uh, multi channel scanning micro radiometer was there. Uh, thereafter, uh, Indo French uh, megatropics. And then uh, last year, we have a uh, Humidity sounder, this experimental satellite, uh, it is there that is also for uh, being used for the atmospheric remote sensing, uh, humidity sounder, similar to uh, we can say with the megatropic one, uh, Sapir was there. Then another uh, very beautiful sensor is scatterometer, which is the for the uh, ocean surface winds, uh, which is being used in the assimilation of the uh, numerical model. So we have ocean set two uh, scatterometer, then we have sketch set one scatterometer. And then uh, last year we ocean set three scatterometer, uh, which was there, and we ocean set three will be there. Uh, for high resolution point of view, uh, similar to that uh, uh, Earth observation satellites or the optical satellite, we have the airborne uh, synthetic, synthetic aperture radar. The advantage of this microwave is there in the cloudy time also, you can have the observation, uh, uh, not, not like uh, visible uh, or any uh, this uh, type of sensor. Uh, because uh, many times uh, in the disaster, as well as in the for the even crop point of view, in the rainy season or in the cloudy season, you don't have any uh, observation. So these sensors are very very important from that point of view. Like uh, one we call it the synthetic aperture radar sensor, which is a very very high resolution sensor uh, in the meter scale. Uh, we have so we have this sensor from the RI set one, which has uh, earlier was there, and then last year we have RI set one A. The C band sensor it is there, and then uh, as the Professor Kelka was talking about, we will be having a NASA ISRO synthetic aperture radar, which is going to be launched uh, uh, next year, uh, early next year. I will talk about this uh, briefly about these things. Uh, if uh, we talk about that uh, met ocean satellites, then uh, from Bhaskara one series, uh, as you can see, uh, we have a uh, different different now uh, up to that uh, we can go Bhaskara one, uh, ocean set one, ocean set two, megatropics. And then uh, reset one uh, is mainly for the Earth observation, what we call it, uh, but uh, it is being used for the, the ocean and uh, atmosphere also because many atmospheric features also can be seen and for ocean also for high resolution thing. Uh, this is a reset type of sensor there. Then Saral, Sketch set one, as I told, ocean set three is there and Anisar. So this is the uh, series from the uh, sensor for the met ocean in the low Earth orbit, that is the polar orbit, not the just in uh, orbit. Uh, presently, uh, earlier I will talk about that these are the, where the total sensors which were there and which uh, have been launched. But presently, these are the sensors in, in orbits, uh, 
which are being used and resource at 22A as well as the US04, uh, that is a uh, synthetic pressure radar, uh, similar to RIZ1 I, I was talking about. And then uh, Cartosat is there, Feral Altimeter is there, and then Inset 3D, 3DR, these are the sensor. And right side, what I was talking about, these are the recent uh, sensors are the US, US04, because uh, we started naming it uh, not the sensor wise, but Earth observation sensor uh, uh, system, that is a four is a synthetic aperture radar. Then US6, it is similar to, uh, to the what we say, Ocean Set earlier, we called it Ocean Set series, Ocean Set 1, 2. Now, this is the Ocean Set 3, we can say, or US06. Uh, I will just uh, talk about this. What is the more in that uh, earlier to then that uh, Ocean Set uh, 2? This is the what is the more. And then uh, NASA ISRO synthetic aperture radar is there, and Inset 3DS, which will be launched uh, similar to, as I told, uh, uh, in the and, uh, earlier uh, Inset uh, 3D, 3DR. So US04, this is the continuity mission of RS-1, as I told. Uh, and uh, it has many, many modes uh, with high resolution and very, very fine resolution mode, as well as the course resolution. And course resolution, in this case, we call it the 50 meter uh, resolution, not like uh, uh, atmospheric ocean sciences kilometer. In this course resolution, is 50 meter and high resolution with a meter scale. So these are the, the uh, scales in the resolution. We talk about these uh, satellites. Uh, and also, but uh, the, as you go different, different resolution, your total area coverage, that is SWAT, we call it, is less. So this is the, some of the disadvantage we can say, we go with the high resolution uh, sensors. You don't have much area coverage uh, and uh, repetitivity is suppose uh, 20 days, 25 days. So every 20, 25 days, only with one satellite, you can have the coverage of a particular area. Uh, uh, so depending upon the, what type of applications we have, uh, we operate in different, different modes like for the generally in the medium resolution mode, uh, 25 meter resolution mode, so that you can have a sufficient large coverage also, as well as the resolution by also. So these are the constraint I can say with a particular satellite. These are some of the applications for the uh, US04. Uh, you can see for the crop application as I was talking about in the uh, monsoon season, this is the one of the major applications we do from the agriculture point of view. Soil moisture is one of the major applications. Uh, earlier we were doing with the very, very coarser resolution, but now we have developed the technique where we can have the uh, almost a 500 meter resolution soil moisture can be provided. And uh, recent floods, as you can see the right uh, side example from the National Remote Sensing uh, Sense, uh, Center, which is uh, having all this data and uh, responsible for the distribution of the data as well as the different products. You can see the flood situation before and after the floods, how it is uh, moving. And some of the ocean applications uh, where the, you can see the cyclone also, a uh, very uh, high resolution picture and internal waves like of, uh, which is very, very important for ocean point of view, you can see. Uh, in the ocean uh, sensor point of view, we have the ocean set series. I was talking ocean set one, two, and three, which is call is, we, now we call it uh, EOS 06. Uh, so ocean set one, we have only ocean color monitor as well as the micro scanning web radiometer was there. A four channel radiometer uh, was there. But ocean set two, we started with the similar to ocean set for ocean color monitor sensor. Uh, but we started a new sensor uh, with the scatterometer. First time we had a KU band uh, scatterometer, uh, which is global sensor for ocean surface wind, as well as the occultation uh, sounder for atmosphere was there. In Ocean Set 3, one uh, major uh, change from the Ocean Set 1 and 2 in the Ocean Color Sensor was there. Uh, from the 8 band, we came to the 13 band uh, Ocean Color Monitor Sensor and the bandwidth was uh, narrow. So we can have much more, many more uh, applications as well as improved products from this, where what you can see from the right hand side figure, algal bloom very clearly, you can see as well as sediment. So these type of things uh, we can do much more uh, better way. And then uh, uh, KU band scatterometer similar to the earlier scatterometer, but advantage is there where we have a higher resolution. Earlier, we had first we started talking from the 50 kilometer, then 25 kilometer, and now we are talking 12.5 kilometer uh, uh, resolution of the uh, ocean surface wind. And uh, in this, we tried very uh, high resolution, that means uh, 5 kilometer mode also we are tried experimental. So if it is successful that we are analysis is going on, if it is successful for the like just like for the coastal regions or for cyclone time, we uh, this mode can be tried in the next uh, series of satellite with the maybe operation also depending upon the what type of uh, data or uh, analysis we have 
and uh, whether uh, all these resources we get from the satellite because large bandwidth will be required, all those things. So this was the, uh, as uh, earlier also I talked about, the ocean set one uh, was there in uh, 1990, right? With, uh, and these are some of the products, uh, uh, water products, sea surface weight, uh, sea surface temperature, cloud liquid water from this uh, radio meter. This was the first time we had the space bone, uh, this uh, the port channel with the uh, uh, polarization, uh, vertical and horizontal polarization sensor. And uh, addition to this uh, ocean color monitor, which is uh, very, very important from the point of view of the ocean uh, point of view of the Ministry of Water Sciences. Uh, from the fishery, potential fishery zone was the, one of the major applications earlier, but now the many, many more applications are being uh, tried with this uh, sensor. Ocean set two series that uh, scatometer, as I told, you started. And then uh, one uh, major advantage was there we are having ocean set winds also, as well as the ocean color from this. So, your right, right hand side, you see an image uh, overlaid of the, the uh, particular uh, cyclone case in the that was a big cyclone. Now, all of you knowing that uh, Pylin cyclone, uh, which is a, one of the major cyclone. So having that uh, both the th uh, sensors, uh, ocean color monitor, as well as ocean surface wind, uh, we can know that uh, in one productivity also, how it is a productivity after the cyclone uh, passes uh, that track, uh, you can have the more productivity, that type of applications were there. But anyhow, one of the major application was that uh, how that uh, sensor is given the uh, ocean surface wind. Uh, very very correctly uh, with, when the no institute data is there so in that time we had this whole started from this uh, predictions of the cyclone monitoring of the cyclone and analysis of the auto effects so whole analysis was done uh, for this particular cyclone uh, using uh, all these data as well as the ground truth data and then very nice report we had made uh, for the pilin cyclone so that showed that uh, everything can be done using the uh, satellite data as well as the uh, Institute data. Then this is the sensor ocean set three. Uh, uh, as I told uh, earlier, we have eight band only, but now we have a thirteen band ocean color monitor. Where the in blue color you can see that these are the new channels. All other channels are the uh, channel in the ocean set one and two also, but uh, these five channels mainly for the turbidity in the coastal water. Fluorescence is one of the major thing. We have the, these two, uh, two channels for that as well as the bandwidth also, and now it is uh, less than uh, uh, earlier, fine, finer bandwidth with a more uh, better SNR. Uh, so these are the, uh, we, uh, in this we have uh, uh, another sensor also, the third sensor was that uh, sea surface temperature monitor, but unfortunately uh, that uh, has a problem. So now we are working with the only scatometer and uh, ocean color monitor. But if we had a SST also, then we could have uh, many, many more applications, what we had thought earlier with using all three sensors in the harmonized mode. Uh, these are some of the applications of this uh, and the uh, not application, I can see products which are readily available to the users like uh, uh, chlorophyll, uh, total suspended matters, and even attenuation coefficient, aerosol optical depth also for the uh, land. Uh, we are trying, uh, we are not trying, uh, we have developed and this is available from this uh, our website. So these are the application from NRST uh, site data uh, is available uh, for the user. You clearly you see the high UV product, high dust, a uh, movement of the dust from these sensors. Uh, uh, and this uh, sensor is a 360 meter resolution. And, uh, and beauty of this is every second day, uh, you can get the data. So, so every alternate day, you have the data from this uh, sensor. Uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, picture of the uh, recent cyclones uh, we have, which we had uh, this year itself. Uh, and then you can see progress of the cyclone, uh, uh, how beautifully it is monitored through this uh, uh, scatometer data. And then uh, uh, not only the monitoring of the program, but cyclogenesis itself, uh, we, we, we are doing using scatometer data so that even the cyclone is coming uh, at least uh, two, three days before. A cyclone is being developed uh, that also are, are being done and then all this after effects of this cyclone so everything uh, like that are being done uh in that series uh, uh there are as i told in set one two uh, all these series were there but mainly if you see the, these are these were the uh, where they are showing with the orange color these are the uh, insect uh, series or geostationary uh, satellite which are for the uh, atmospheric science as a professor kilkro was talking in set 3d 3dr as well as one was there, Kalpana also uh, uh, satellite, which worked uh, beautifully for the very, very long.
so uh, all these are the insert series of satellite which we started from the having insert 1a which is the vhr sensor and now uh, we, we reached up to the insert 3ds uh, which is being launched uh, this year so these are some of the uh, applications or the products uh, i will not go detail because professor kirkar has talked about all this uh, in much detail and much better way but uh, uh, i'm showing in the slide so that afterwards also if you got you can go through that and then uh, utilize these things uh, for your uh, study and then uh, for uh, any other uh, clarification are there uh, those can be done so these are the products from insert 3d 3dr and 3ds uh, many products are there almost uh, I, I, so i remember correctly more than 35 products are being generated uh, uh, to, through this uh, insert 3d and 3dr and uh, regularly being uh, made available and uh, imd is uh, having all these products and being utilized regularly for the uh, you all of you know that uh, for the improved uh, weather predictions uh, yeah. in the indian region uh, not only major but sounder which is the sensor mainly for the vertical profiling uh, is being used temperature and humidity profile is being used for that uh, to know the whole uh, profile and then uh, uh, improved uh, prediction in this case also uh so i i just skip this uh, uh, slide uh, so uh, yeah this is the ocean set uh, series uh, in addition to ocean set uh, one more scattermeter we had which is uh, which was the uh, fill in the gap between the ocean set 2 we had a 2009 and then uh, ocean set 3 was uh, uh, getting delayed so we have a scattermeter which was not working in between after 2009 uh, after a few years so sket set 1 was there which is similar to ocean set set Ocean set uh, two scattermeter. We have a KU band scattermeter, which is a rotating beam, and providing a, a, a wind vector is the 25 kilometer, 25 kilometer all over the globe with the overall swath we so call it. In this case, swath is a 1800 kilometer. You can assume that a very very uh, large swath, so that uh, we can have you know, wind vector. This was the megatropic uh, uh, satellite, which is the endoprene satellite, which has a uh, Sensor, uh, which is one, one was the Madras, which was the radiometer, then was the Sapir, uh, which is the sounder, uh, 183 gigahertz sounder, and then our radiation sensor is Carib was there, in addition to that one uh, sensor for the profiling that uh, uh, Rosa was there. So this uh, satellite uh, was there for the, mainly, it was uh, supposed to be a science mission uh, in the mainly uh, this orbit, uh, equatorial orbit only. Uh, so. So that we can have a very frequent uh, observations of that uh, in the low Earth orbit of the uh, this equatorial region, uh, because all other satellites are polar orbit, so you don't get uh, data very regularly. Uh, but in this case, sometimes six orbit, seven orbit, also in a day you can get and different time. So this sensor uh, was used uh, uh, largely uh, for to understanding the uh, atmospheric uh, impacts. Uh, then this is uh, one more uh, sensor will be coming in the uh, future, which is the, uh, we call it Trishna, Thermal Infrared Imaging Satellite for High Resolution Natural Resource uh, uh, Assessment. Uh, this will be, a, a, this is also a, a collaboration between uh, India and France. And uh, this will be the one of the sensor with the high resolution with, uh, thermal infrared band, as well as the visible and near infrared bands uh, and uh, sphere bands. So all this will be there uh, with the resolution of the 57 meter for the mainly with the continental regions and one kilometer in the ocean region. You can understand how good this satellite will be there uh, for this under understanding this uh, uh, surface uh, features as well as the uh, atmosphere and ocean features in the in this region. This will be coming in 25, 26 uh, time frame. Then uh, this is the uh, being talked uh, since. Uh, Couple of years, uh, NASA ISRO Centric Aperture Radar, uh, which is the two bands uh, sensor, is there. I'll just uh, yeah. uh, L band and S band. Uh, so, advantage of this is their L band is from the uh, NASA side and S band is being developed from the Indian side. Uh, this sensor is not like uh, all other sensor which we are earlier we having the Centric Aperture Radar. The advantage of this is one technology, what is called the sweeps are technology. I will come in, in the next slide. Uh, Sir, uh, one, uh, how many slides are remaining? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, I think uh, three, four. Okay, okay. Uh, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 
So uh, yeah, so this will be a sweep chart technology, which is large swath will be having and high resolution also. That is a basic advantage of this uh, satellite and repetitivity is a uh, 12 day repetitivity is there. So this is the mission science mission, which is uh, mainly used for the uh, uh, dynamics of the earth uh, as a cryosphere, as well as the disaster point of view. So this is this sensor uh, because very, very uh, accurate, uh, you can have that uh, information uh, of this uh, dynamics of this, all those things. And uh, yeah, this is a characteristic by you see, this is a L band and S band as, a, as I was talking about. And many, many all type of polarization will be there uh, in this sensor. And uh, this right side, the sweep sort technology, I was just uh, very, very briefly, I'll talk about because of this technology and a very big uh, antenna, what you call unparalleled antenna of the 12 meter antenna, uh, you can have that uh, resolution of the three meter as well as the uh, total uh, swath of the around 250 kilometer. Normally, you don't have uh, both the things together. So this uh, technology is there and interferometry is there so that you can have that all this movement for the uh, earthquake and all those things also monitoring will be very, very accurate. So these are the science plan from the ISRO side because uh, NASA has some science plan over their own, but we have jointly also many science uh, plan uh, together we have developed. From, but basically from the ISRO side, what we want to do ecosystem structure that is agriculture, biomass monitoring, disturbance, land deformation, very, very uh, accurately. Cryosphere changes, not only the uh, Himalayan, but polar uh, science, all polar region also coastal and ocean disaster response and many uh, geological application of from the ISRO side point of view. So, and this is the overall, I, I think this is the last slide. Uh, all these things, what I will talk about, uh, data as well, information of all those things are available through, these are the, our uh, portals from ISRO. One is the Bhuvan portal, many of you may be knowing from the uh, NRC, National, National Remote Sensing Center point uh, from there. And Bhuvan itself, we have uh, one more portal is Bhunidhi from where you get the data, all this data, what I was talking about, you get the, from the Bhunidhi portal, this data uh, for the Earth operation point of view. Another portal is meteorological oceanography satellite data, that MOSDEC we call it, where, so we are getting uh, atmospheric ocean science data, as well as many products, as well as some more information application point of view get from the MOSDEC. Another portal is Vedas, uh, where we get analytics of all this uh, uh, data uh, we are doing, as well, and then providing some uh, new information through that. And then fourth portal is endem mainly for the emergency management, uh, like uh, all the disasters. So this uh, all these are the mainly four portals from which we are giving the all the information. What I was talking about all those things. So thank you. And then uh, uh, just uh, this is our today's uh, satellite. What we have launched today, Adit uh, mission for the uh, sun, which will be going in the four months uh, to the. Then we will have the observation of the another. <laughs> our solar system uh, much better. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thanks. I, I, we already know, I mean, I have sent those statistics that there are a lot of students who have actually registered for this course and your talk actually enlightened them a lot. So now this is a time for question answer, jointly question answer of uh, Dr. Kelkar's hearts and also yours. So, uh, the question answer, I think Dr. Mohan Kumar Das and Dr. T.B. Lakshmi Kumar will coordinate. So I, I let's Dr. Mohan, you start. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shagata Paida. And also a special thanks to all the distinguished speakers. We have seen lots of questions in the question answer box and as well as in the YouTube channel also. The yeah, first question huge, is from- a huge number. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because very rarely- yeah. we, First we, question is from yeah. Kwai Thaan U. Uh, he or she asked very interesting. Uh, it it's true that satellite can count Western disturbance. Here, could you suggest that? Where can I get the historical Western disturbance data? Otherwise, could you mention generally the area size, cloud dense, or depth, or top temperature can be identified by the Western disturbance? I think this is for Calcutta, sir. Yeah. It's, it's a good question because you know studying historical data with satellites is uh, involving a massive amount of data because you know one satellite image consists of something like 6,000 by 6,000 pixels, which is 36 million if I'm right. And if you want something over the last 25 years, you can imagine the type of data that, that is, so you just can't get it by sending a postcard. It's not possible. You'll have to tie up with somebody who can 
really arrange for some kind of a study together. And every time there's a Western disturbance, all Western disturbances are not the same. Some are weak, some are strong, some are well, much to the higher latitudes. So you may be interested in one, someone else may be interested in something else. And the other question was about cloud top temperatures. Usually the Western disturbances are shallow disturbances. They, they are not very tall. And they don't really kind of differentiate uh, within the clouds. It's more like an extra tropical system than a tropical system. Is, is that answering the question or is there something more in it? I think, thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, so actually, there are many questions. So I, uh, if uh, you get some more time in that, then you can include some more. So next question yeah. is from Gitesh Vasan. Uh, question is, can you please tell me more about tropical satellite and what is it? what it is used for exactly? Is it for me? Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I think so. I mentioned, I mentioned yeah, tropical satellite. System. Questions I mentioned the system of floated to both of you. So anyone can okay. take the question. Okay. Uh, I had mentioned a series of tropics satellite. Tropics is an acronym for something, and S is for small sat. There's something like nine satellites to be launched in the next uh, couple of years. And these are low altitude, low latitude uh, satellites, which are basically meant to operate over the tropics because cyclone forms only within the tropics. So the idea is to get a very closer look into the structure of tropical cyclones. See, one of the things is to tell us, to tell people where it is going. And the other is to study the cyclone because the more we know the interior of the cyclone, the better will be our intensity prediction. It's not simply telling that this is going to make a landfall between this place and that and you evacuate people. That's a simpler part of life. But to, to tell how the cyclone is forming, how it is dissipating, how much time it will take to dissipate and, and so on, because many times cyclones linger on. Even after the landfall, they linger on for a long time. So the structure of the cyclone within the system is something that the tropics satellite array is uh, going to give us, but that's somewhere in the future, not exactly as of now. Mohan, just one minute. Uh, all the participants, yeah, I'm requesting to uh, complete the attendance sheets if it is still uh, remaining. So we are floating the attendance sheet right now again. So please do the needful. Yeah, Mohan, you can continue. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, please. So next question is from Kamishwari Nunna. Uh, what is the lowest level of lowest level close to surface in the moisture data of the atmospheric column? Is that for Dr. Rajkumar or for me? Dr. Rajkumar, you have an answer. Uh, I think sir, a first couple of questions you can answer, okay. then uh, I think we can go for the uh, Rajkumar sir also. Okay. See, the, the question is difficult because uh, the soil moisture itself, you know, the soil has different levels of moisture. If you start digging into the soil, uh, what is the moisture at, at the surface is, is, is quite different from the moisture at, say, uh, 30 centimeters level underneath. Now, if you want a satellite to find out how much is the soil moisture underneath, it's a tough thing. You can't do it with a meteorological satellite, but there are satellites like ESMOS, uh, which is the salinity and soil moisture satellite. It's, it's very peculiar that a satellite with a certain kind of uh, radar a microwave sensor can get the salinity of the oceans and the moisture content of the soil. They, they look very different, but they are they're monitored by the same sensor. So there are satellites which can probe into the soil to find out the moisture level, but I don't think I can elaborate further on that. Yeah, I think I think what he, he was or she was talking about mostly about the atmosphere column. I think uh, what uh, moisture okay. they wanted to know uh, atmosphere uh, how much uh, we can go. Up to maybe 850 millibar or 1000 millibar type of uh, uh, moisture we can monitor. I think because what question I am seeing is uh, moisture data of the atmospheric column. So, okay. so depending upon the what type of sensor, like uh, when we have a sounders, a different sounder, depending yes. upon the how many channels you have, you can uh, go up to the uh, very, very uh, bottom also. Uh, bottom means maybe up to 1000 millibar or 950 millibar also uh, channel, depending upon the what channel you have in the uh, your sounder. So, yeah, that's right. I think it's the, it's the inside sounder configuration uh, that will decide, I mean, how many channels you can split into. Yeah. And then again, it also depends on the resolution because if the resolution is not so good, we won't get much information from it. That's right. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. There is a very basic one question. What is the difference between revisit and repeatability? Okay, it's, a simple question. it's a simple question. 
uh, repetitivity is uh, how often will the satellite come? And the revisit usually is a question of time. I mean, if it visits at 11 o'clock in the morning today, it should visit again at the same time tomorrow. Otherwise, you, know, you can't compare things. So repetitivity means how many times in a day it will come. And the revisit is the time of like just you're expecting a guest. You should know when he's coming. So when a satellite is due, you should know the time. So the revisit is slightly different, but they may boil down to the same things eventually. Maybe Dr. Rashkumar can explain further. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, this also, uh, yeah, this is somewhat similar uh, words the birding says, but repeatedly, exactly repeatedly means ki, like uh, some satellites are gay after 20 days, 25 days, exactly yes. same. If you are having another yes. looking satellite, exactly same place, uh, how many <coughs> days after it will come. And revisit yes. sometimes we can, uh, because some of the satellites you can uh, tilt also. So same area if you want to monitor like uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, today you can be, uh, uh, see from the nadir tomorrow if you change the uh, angle you can see so that is something yeah. like revisit repeatedly exactly same the uh, angle same uh, uh, illumination condition when you are looking that comes after many days depending upon the what orbit you are having okay. right, sir sir is, there is one question related to nadir is mostly weather satellite takes the picture in nadir mode uh, question by anshul goel Yes, uh, mostly weather satellites are, uh, uh, you can say, uh, Nadir, uh, like all this in Saturn. But uh, Nadir means not exactly Nadir because uh, you have a very large uh, field of view. Uh, like mm -hmm. in inside, you see, it is not Nadir means it is not only zero degree because uh, uh, you can see up to the almost uh, 20 degree, 30 degree. Nothing, I'll, I'll add That's a little it. to that. See, there is, there is a Nadir view and a slant view. And the two are slightly different. When we have a nadir view, the reflection or the emission from the surface goes back to the satellite. And in a slant view, it doesn't. So there is a little difference. There are some applications which need a nadir view and some applications we don't need a nadir view. I think that's one of the things to be considered. Thank you, sir. So Ramon uh, wants to know, are there any ongoing and upcoming satellite mission that are specific? especially aimed at improving meteorological forecasting and, and climate monitoring in the Indian subcontinent. Okay, I think he has to see my presentation once again, because I ended up with a list of satellites which are upcoming. Uh, and it, there was a long list, and I'd even given a list of 10 satellites which were launched just in the last five months. So on that, I would say, let him look at the, have, have a rewind of, of, the, of the session and watch it again. Lakshmi are you there? Uh, Mohan, I'm here. Can you hear me, Mohan? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, we can hear. So I think you can uh, take care of rest of the part also. If regard, yeah, you can uh, tell me, then I will help. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So first of all, thank you to uh, Dr. Kelsar sir and Raj Kumar sir. So I'll take a few questions from the uh, questions asked by the participants. Uh, there is one question from Raman. Uh, his question is, uh, how is artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning be integrated with satellite data to improve the accuracy of weather forecasting models in India. Can I repeat the question, shall I, sir? Shall I take the question? Yes. Yes. yes sir, okay. Yes. See, this is you know this is now a fashionable thing that whenever you bring in something futuristic, you must talk of AI and ML. But uh, in the case of satellites, I don't think it's a fashionable thing. It's it's a necessity because as I said a few minutes back, one satellite which is something like thirty six million bits of information. It is beyond human beings to look into a database of something like 30 years or 40 years and find out from that. So it should be something, I mean, those the era of making atlases, I think, is now over. You need something which is online, available uh, in a digital mode. And moment, for example, a tropical cyclones forms, say, in the southeastern Bay of Bengal. Artificial intelligence will immediately tell you how many times it has gone where in the past 50 years or 60 years and where it is likely to go this time? Because that's what people did when they did things manually. I mean, someone will say, he look at the picture, this is T4 or this is going to hit Bangladesh. We no, no longer do that because we have a track system, prediction system using NWP. But AI and ML, I think, can learn so much from the past. And especially in the India Meteorological Department, was established 150 years back. There's a lot of data even before satellite pictures came into the picture. There's a lot of data recorded from ship captains and ship logs as to how they faced uh, uh, storms in the ocean when they, they, even wireless was not there. And they would come to, to land and tell their experiences and it has been documented. 
So to, to read these documents and use it for the future, I think it's a very important thing to do. So the future is AI and ML. I definitely say that. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is a question from Gauri Lakshmi. Uh, her question is, uh, does a single satellite can predict a different climatic phenomena? How long will it take for a weather prediction after satellite data analysis? This Maybe from this Lakshmi? Kelka, sir. Ah, yes, okay. sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. See, yep. uh, you're mixing things here. See, the climate has a different uh, time scale and weather has a different time scale. You, you, have, you have to separate those. I mean, climate is something which is uh, over a long, long period of time, but weather is something which is instantaneous. So if you learn something about the weather, you cannot apply to climate straight away because otherwise we'll be mixing different time scale. Like today's monsoon, for example, if it is not doing so well, it doesn't mean that the climate has changed. It will revert back again next year and become normal. So I don't really understand your question because you have mixed too many time scales into one. But satellites basically are meant for reporting instantaneous information. And if you use them over a period of time, you can get climate applications. But there are certain factors which climate applications need. For example, sea level or say melting of glaciers. You don't want to wait for 10 years. You want it now, but or carbon dioxide. You don't want to wait for 10 years to come to a conclusion. So those are specific to climate and they are not used for the weather. I think that's about all that I can explain. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, there is one question from Khan Mohammed. Uh, can you talk about a open source satellite images from India? Yes, I think uh, Dr. Rashkumar can. can yeah, that. this is actually as I shown in the last slide. There is uh, our uh, websites are there uh, where you can get this satellite data. One is the Bhunidi, as I told uh, from the National Remote Sensing Center. One uh, is there uh, Bhunidi. You can get the data uh, from the. You, you have to register, log in, and then uh, you have to tell uh, for what purpose. Uh, mainly for the research as a purpose, you can get this data. And another for the atmospheric ocean uh, related, MOSDEX site, uh, site is there. From that, you can get this data. Uh, so, there's another Actually, important question. Uh, yeah. Can I take one more? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the satellites you are mentioning can be accessed to free. Can I download their images without any cost for my research purpose? Yes, that's what I told. Uh, you have to register it. Uh, you have to tell the, okay, uh, mainly from the university or anywhere. Uh, you can get the data free. Yes. Thank you, sir. Swagata, uh, uh, yeah, you can go, you, you know you can ask more questions, but I'm I'm seeing one question which I feel very interesting, but I don't know many people have already asked or not. Uh, how to address various changes associated with doing long-term studies using various satellite missions like intersensor calibration? Because you know, we in set two we may did some temperature, in set three, we may you are again doing the temperature. But there are different type of sensors. So how to I mean, manage this inter-sensor calibration? Yes, uh, that is very, very important. Very, yeah, very, very interesting. A very important question. Uh, yeah, that is the inter yeah. When we uh, talk, about, talk about climate data quality, that time this is, comes in the picture. Otherwise, it's not required. But we have, uh, suppose you want 50 years data, you want to, uh, as you told, in that 3D, 3DR, 3DS will be coming. If you want to generate the data to see the changes, very, very uh, minute changes, but not, uh, very uh, coarse changes, anyhow you can get, uh, but uh, minute changes you want to see, then you have to intercalibrate. For that purpose, only we do, uh, one uh, technique is there, uh, earlier what we are doing, using the uh, ground truth, we can have uh, calibration for different sensors. But uh, intercalibration of the sensor from the inter-sensors also, G6, what we call it, G6 is one, uh, site is there where you do all this calibration from the one sensor to another sensor also uh, uh, geostationary to uh, low earth orbit as well as the uh, low earth orbit to geostationary both ways uh, you do so uh, uh, that type of things are being done so that you can generate the ecvs mainly uh, uh, essential climate variable what we call it so for that purpose this uh, yeah this uh, calibration is very very important for our point thank you sir uh, just uh, before closing this i just want to know that is any panelists want to ask any questions? Any uh, Swata, it, Swata, it seems there are many questions from uh, Q&A box. Uh, probably these can be answered at, at this later by the speaker. Yeah, 47 Maybe, questions yeah. I can see. Yeah, because there are many, many interesting questions. No, I'm asking there. from the panelists from here uh, if anybody has any questions. 
So I think there is no question from panelists. Others, I think we can consider later. Uh, Dr. Mohan, do you have any more questions? Uh, do you want to ask any more? Yes, yes, exactly. There is actually a huge question. Still, uh, participants are uh, writing their question in the chat box. Even I have noted down. I have seen uh, some question in the uh, YouTube as well. So Shivaji Patel, uh, Anjol Goel uh, asked, how can we retrieve the visible data from which and which side? Yeah, this is uh, from the side. IMD also, I think you can get this data. Vis visibility data or visible data? I don't know. Uh, visibility, visibility data. data. I mean, I visibility data. data. Fog related data. Yeah, that also I right. available because that is one of the product you can get. No, visibility. Sir, one I can more question. Sir. Sir. Please, sir. Uh, can I tell about visibility? Visibility yes. is, is a ground thing which is usually measured at airports. Uh, it is not something on a synoptic scale or something like that. And uh, there are a lot of sites which are related to civil aviation because uh, meteorological department usually give weather services for civil aviation. So visibility is an important product which you will get from the pilot's workstations, uh, which uh, IMD provides. So not from the satellite uh, website, but from different websites. But they will be there somewhere. Yeah, by transmission meter. Yeah. Okay, sir. So uh, another uh, question from Nidra Nobelist. What satellite used for polar meteorological monitoring? Is there any dedicated satellite? What's the polar monitoring? Yes, sir. Polar meteorological monitoring. Polar okay, I, I think, yeah, yeah let, let me handle this. See, India has still not launched polar orbiting meteorological satellites. There are a lot of remote sensing satellites which are polar orbiting, but not the meteorological satellite. And I think it is high time uh, that we uh, augment our geostationary satellites with polar orbiting satellites also, uh, because India has now a presence in the Arctic as well as in the Antarctic. So this is a good suggestion. We don't have such a satellite, but other countries have. Most other countries have polar orbiting satellites. I think more now we can stop because time is exactly what we wish. Uh, so it okay, is I think we can check. Is there any one or two some important questions? Or right. actually, most of the participants are uh, interested for get the download data link. So I think they will get some information. Yeah, I, I from noticed the... one questions from your that screen. What is the difference yes. of imager and sounder? Okay, right, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. You sounder. want that to answer? Yeah. 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 Okay, it, it's a very simple thing. An imager is something which is a satellite uh, looking just down, and whatever it sees in front of it, like a CCTV camera, it just records that. While a sounder is trying to cut through the slice of the atmosphere, which is very different. It, it is something that uh, it finds out a, a profile of the atmosphere which is very different and uh, the whole technique is different it, it's not really the same so there, there are two different things one gives you a profile like a radio sound balloon which is going up to the sky and the other is like a, if you're flying in an airplane you're looking down you'll see something in one go that's that is a major difference yeah the, uh, treat this question as a last question dr mohan okay i think we can take this question as the last one dr nolika r dayananda how we can use satellite based meteorology for agriculture drought monitoring. Is there any special methodology for that? Dr. Rashmo, would you like to handle for, that? For drought monitoring. For drought monitoring. Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the satellite is being used for the drought monitoring because if you see the drought monitoring, what, what you use, uh, what you need for drought monitoring, well, mainly rain, rainfall, soil moisture. These two things are uh, more important from the drought point of view. Uh, for, if you say uh, define the agriculture drought or the uh, meteorological drought. So uh, rainfall-based uh, drought monitoring, we, we are doing actually. It is being done uh, with uh, uh, IMD as well as this uh, agriculture department and its role together. Drought monitoring. Yes, is being I'd, I'd like to add a little here. There is a, a parameter called the vegetation index, uh, which comes from polar orbiting satellites. And that is also a good indicator to see whether vegetation is growing well or not growing well. Uh, this is something that uh, is also useful. Yeah, NDVI, what you want to call it, yeah. Yeah, NDVI, yes. Normalized vegetation index. Thank yeah, you. So Still, there are more questions. I think we can uh, send those questions to the, our today's resource persons. If 
uh, star, uh, both uh, distinguished star uh, wish to re reply. So I think you can send those reply to the participant. Also, they are interested to get the uh, what is called PPD uh, power uh, PDF of the slides. So and yeah, that's all. Shagata, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Mohan and Dr. Lakshmi for conducting that uh, question and answer session. Uh, we are able to take around 20 questions and which is really great but we, I, I noticed that this is more than 50 questions are there uh, so due to the time constraint we cannot go further now it's a uh, vote of thanks to let's say i invite dr dibba prakash to say vote of thanks Good evening, one and all present here. As we bring, uh, bring this remarkable inaugural session of the Satellite Metrology weekly online lecture series to a close. It is my distinct privilege to extend our deepest gratitude to the exceptional individuals who have pivoted a role in uh, making this event and crystal clear success. On behalf of South Asian Metallurgical Association and the Birla Institute of Technology Mesra, India, I have the honor of delivering this heartfelt vote of thanks. We commence by expressing our profound appreciation to Professor Somiswar Das, Secretary of SAMA, for his gracious and engaging welcome, setting a tone of inspiration for our gathering. Our sincere thanks extend to uh, ABM retired Professor Dr. Ajit Tyagi, Tyagi sir, President of SAMA, for his enlightening address and unwavering support and uh, continues to ignite our motivation. Our heart heartfelt gratitude goes to Dr. C. Jagannathan sir, Dean of uh, Research and Development Cell at BIT Mesra, for generously sharing his uh, valuable insights in reaching our understanding of the subject. I am very much thankful to Dr. R.C. Bhatia, sir, Chairman of the Advisory Panel of Satellite Metrology, merits our sincere appreciation for his invaluable contributions instrumental in shaping the success of this event. Further, our appreciation extends to Dr. R.R. R. Kelter, former Director General of Indian, India Metrological Department, and Dr. Rajkumar Kumar Sarma, sir, former director of NRSC ISRO for their uh, informative presentations and their support, setting light on the metrological satellites and uh, their applications and remarkable history of ISRO's mission and satellite missions. We are, we are also think, uh, wish to acknowledge the contribution of Dr. Sunita Verma and uh, Dr. Millie Roseman for their integral roles in introducing our distinguished resource person. Our gratitude extends to Dr. Mohan Kumar Das, sir, and uh, Lakshmi Kumar, who skillfully moderated the interactive question answer session, fostering a vibrant exchange of knowledge. A special recognition is due to Dr. Swagata Paira, our diligent uh, session moderator, who did de dedication ensured the seamless flow of the cement. We are also thankful to Dr. M. P. Punia, sir, for his time support. Finally, we express our heartfelt thanks to all the participants and attendees who joined us from across the globe. Your presence added immense value to this occasion. In conclusion, let us celebrate today as the commencement of an accelerating journey into the realm of satellite metrology. We eagerly anticipate the forthcoming lectures in this series and the wealth of knowledge they promise to impart. Once more, we extend our gratitude for your unwavering support and anticipate your continued, continued participation in our future sessions. Together, we shall continue to explore the captivating world of metrological satellites and their indispensable applications with the heartfelt thanks and wishes for a splendid day ahead. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Deepak Prakash. So let's uh, 
uh, I could say that we have concluded the first inaugural, uh, the first, uh, we have concluded the inaugural session. Uh, so from next week, we'll start our original uh, lecture series uh, for the satellite meteorology. Uh, we'll start by Dr. R.C. Bhatia, overview of satellite meteorology and its application. Uh, if is there any word from any panelist, please speak it out and then we'll close the program. Yeah, so let me express my gratitude to both our distinguished speakers, uh, Telkar Saab and Dr. Rajkumar for setting tone for these uh, lecture series. Uh, you have set a, a, see, a landmark things for us uh, to follow. And next one, let me assure you that uh, we will be delivering a good quality 20 lecture series. And uh, we continue to seek your guidance and support. And I'm sure some of the questions which organizers may send you for your comments or for you uh, may kindly oblige them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, uh, Dr. Rajkumar, sir, Dr. Kelka, sir, if you want to say anything at the end. I'd like to, I'd like to say just one thing. Uh, my, if people are watching, my email ID is r dot r dot k e l k e r at gmail dot com. Very simple to remember. Just my name followed by gmail dot com. If anyone wants to from the audience wants to get my PPT or anything, they're free to write to me. R dot r dot kelkar at gmail dot com. That's all. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to speak. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, I just uh, <laughs> thank you all of you uh, for giving us opportunity. This was a great session. I think very good questions. Now that is a uh, researchers were very attentive. It looks there. <laughs> yeah, Dean said, do we want to say something at the end? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, the experts, Kelkar sir and Rajkumar sir, for the wonderful, captivating presentation and the informative lecture. And thanks to all the organizing team as well as the participant. It is a fantastic effort. I wish you all the success. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much, sir. Do I want wish to... to thank Dr. Kilkar and Dr. Rajkumar for their excellent presentation and making a very good beginning for this wonderful course, which we are going to start next week. It was a very good beginning, I should say. That. Thank you for your efforts and for your time for this course. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, certainly we are grateful to Dr. Kelkar Saab as well as Dr. Rajkumar sir for their <clears throat> immediate uh, response when we requested them to deliver the lectures. So they quickly responded, unlike many others who take time to respond. So thank you so much, sir, for quickly responding to, to our invitation. I could see that you know in the chat box, many people are asking about the uh, PDF of the lectures, uh, of course, uh, later on for all the lectures, we do request the speakers to provide the PDF file if possible. But even if it is not available, all the lectures as announced, they are all available on the YouTube channel uh, summer, even after the lecture is over, they will remain available. So anybody can go back and uh, watch the lectures. And if somebody has missed, uh, because I can see that about 360 people watched it live uh, on the Zoom as well as what 50 people were watching on the YouTube. So altogether, it makes only 400 or something. Whereas the total registration is more than 1,600. So obviously, many people have not been able to attend. And uh, one reason is because of the time difference between the different countries and India. So for them also, the lectures are being made available on the YouTube channel of summer. So they're always welcome to watch the lectures uh, on the YouTube. And uh, also, at the end of the lecture series, after four months, uh, it will be helpful to you all, uh, all the participants, to to review those lectures and uh, appear in the test if you want to appear in the test for your certificate. So that's all from my side, and then hope uh, many more than what I attended today. Because I see that people were also asking that you know, I just registered today, but I could not get the link. Blah blah blah. Obviously, if you registered today, then how can you get the link? So those who registered till yesterday, last night, they were all given the link, but those who registered today, they could not. So, and we have also looking at the, uh, I mean, overwhelming response of the people. Although we thought to close the registration by 31st, but now we have kept it open. Now for next one week, we will be now, uh, keeping this open. So people are welcome to register. Uh, and uh, obviously those who register today and 
afterwards, you know, they will all be given the uh, link to attend the lectures. Uh, so please do attend. And, but even if we are not able to give you the link, the YouTube links are always available. Okay, so that's yes. all from my side. Thank you, Dr. Swagat. Yeah, nice thank you. So I'm closing the session for today. So we'll again meet on the next Saturday, 3 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.